It was in the seventh year of being with Mary that I finally learned she had an unforgettable first love she had been infatuated with for years, and on the day I was diagnosed with stomach cancer, her unforgettable first love returned to the country. When I went to the hospital alone for chemotherapy, I saw her and that man walking out of the obstetrics and gynecology department. I finally made up my mind to ask for a divorce and set her free, but her eyes reddened, and she said she would abort the child and return to the family, but I was tired, and I also felt disgusted. Chapter 1 This morning, while tidying up the house, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach. The pain was so intense that I doubled over, drenched in cold sweat. I wanted to ask my wife, Mary, for help, but she just poured me a cup of hot water, placed it in front of me, and then told me she was going out shopping with her girlfriends. I was in so much pain that I couldn't speak. I just watched her, looking radiant and beautiful with her makeup on, wearing a tight, hip-hugging skirt, her eyes exuding charm. She seemed unusually happy today. The excitement in her eyes was something I had never seen before. I didn't have the heart to interrupt her, and she didn't notice how severe my condition was. The door closed with a soft click, and I collapsed onto the floor, clutching the table for support. Suddenly, my stomach churned violently and a metallic taste rose in my throat. The white and gray tiles were soon covered with bright red blood. I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. This was the only thing I could do to save myself. When I arrived at the hospital, the doctors conducted a full examination of my body and finally gave me a conclusion. It was that I was already in the late stages of stomach cancer. The doctor said I needed to start treatment as soon as possible, which might prolong my life. Otherwise, I might only have a few months left. I held the diagnosis in my hand, sitting in the hospital corridor. Feeling a deep sadness, I wanted to call Mary. I desperately wanted to hear her voice, but the line was busy, and all I heard was the persistent beep of a busy signal. I scrolled through my phone and messaged her on WeChat, asking what she was doing, but there was no response. I felt like someone abandoned by the whole world, alone, leaning against the cold walls of the hospital. My phone's notification sound brought a glimmer of hope, but when I opened it, it was just a message from a colleague. My hope shattered again as I realized it was a video. The video was taken at the East Suburb Airport, showing a man and a woman tightly embracing each other. A banner on the side revealed the man's identity, it was William, an accomplished pianist returning from abroad, and the woman was my wife, Mary. I stared at the man's face, lost in my memories. This morning, while cleaning the study, I found a photo of a man inside a book. The man in the photo was William, and on the back was a line of delicate handwriting that read, My unforgettable first love. It was Mary's handwriting, I couldn't mistake it. But before I could confront her about it, this misfortune befell me. My colleague sent me a voice message, sounding worried. Boss, is that your wife? Please don't get mad. Talk it over with her when you get home. If there's a misunderstanding, I don't want to be the one to blame. I'm your brother. I couldn't keep it from you. I'd feel guilty if I did. I thanked him and told him I would handle it properly and that he didn't need to worry. Although I said that, my heart was heavy with sorrow. Chapter 2 Mary's call finally came through, and she sounded like she was having a great time. Honey. What's up? I was watching a movie earlier. Didn't see your message. In the background, I could faintly hear the soothing melody of a piano. I really wanted to know if that person playing was William. Nothing. Just wanted to ask who you went out with today. I happened to have a day off and thought I could spend it with you. Mary hesitated for a moment, her words faltering. Who else? Just Lara. It's just us two girls, so it's probably best if you don't join. Maybe another day. I responded with a quiet, hmm, and hung up the phone. I didn't want to be suspicious of my partner but that video and the photo made it impossible to suppress my emotions. I found Lara's name in my WeChat contacts, opened her chat, and sent a message. Chishi Festival is coming up in a few days. I want to buy Mary a gift and was hoping you could help me pick something. Why don't you just ask Mary directly, or I can teach you how to subtly find out what she wants. Mary is sleeping now. She's been feeling a bit unwell lately, and I didn't want to disturb her. After sending that message, I felt my hands grow more restless, nervously clasping together. I hoped she would confirm that Mary was out shopping with her, but sadly, that wasn't the case. I really envy Mary. I've been so busy with work trips these past few days. I won't be back for over a month. I'll visit her when I return. I didn't know how to respond. My mind in chaos. She had, after all, used a lie to cover up the truth, but deep down, I still clung to a sliver of hope, wishing she would explain it to me, that maybe I had truly misunderstood her. Mary and I met seven years ago during a scorching summer. My career had just started to take off when I received news of my mother's passing. My parents had divorced early, and my mother had raised me on her own. That period was undoubtedly the darkest time of my life. I bought a cup of coffee and sat on a park bench, surrounded by the hustle and bustle of the crowd, yet feeling incredibly lonely. Mary was handing out flyers under the blazing sun. She noticed my low spirits and came over to talk to me. She was like a little sprite of joy, constantly trying to cheer me up. 
She told me she was also an orphan, never having known the love of parents. She had once had an older brother who was her only family, but he had left her to go abroad. Two lonely souls found solace in each other, and my heart began to fill with warmth. After that, I often went to take care of her, and over time, I realized I had fallen in love with her. Confession, proposal, marriage. She accepted quickly, and everything went so smoothly that I thought I had found the love of my life, but now, in hindsight, I realized that William might be the brother she had mentioned, but he wasn't the kind of brother I had imagined, he was her obsession, her unforgettable first love, the person she truly wanted to spend her life with. A bitter ache welled up inside me, and a searing pain flared in my stomach. I rushed to the bathroom, violently retching, blood mixed with the water as it splashed into the white sink. Staring at my disheveled reflection in the mirror, a wave of despair washed over me. In the end, I was all alone. Chapter 3 After picking up my medication from the pharmacy, I returned home and continued cleaning up the mess that was scattered all over the floor. It was already 8 p.m., and Mary still hadn't come home. Feeling worried, I called her, wanting to ask where she was. Ethan, Lara just went through a breakup and is feeling down. I'm going to stay with her for a few days. Make sure you take good care of yourself at home. There was a slight breathlessness in her voice. When I asked her why, she said they had just been doing some cardio exercises. How ridiculous. Lara was on a business trip at the moment. What could Mary possibly be doing? I didn't even want to imagine. And this time, she called me by my name. Ever since we got married, she seemed to want to reassure me by always calling me honey, never by my name. Was she hiding something today? I thought Lara was still on her business trip. I didn't realize she was back. Oh, she just got home after the trip. That's when the breakup happened. All right, you take care of yourself too. The pain, mixed with bitterness, spread throughout my entire heart. My stomach began to cramp again. I swallowed a handful of pills, curled up on the bed, trying to ease my suffering. But the endless darkness and loneliness wrapped around me, veins bulging across my body. And once again, I was completely alone. I didn't sleep the entire night. I thought about a lot of things quit my job, start treatment, and confront Mary to get to the bottom of this. I couldn't let myself be consumed by suspicion any longer. When I got to the office, my colleagues were all talking about the pianist who had just returned to the country and was planning to hold a concert at the end of the month. William's name suddenly reached my ears, and I realized just how famous he was. Mr. Liu, are you taking your wife to the concert? I remember she loves piano music. My breath caught in my throat, and I couldn't help but let my mind wander. I'll look into it later. I still need to ask her what she thinks. A young female colleague couldn't help but sigh. Mr. Liu and his wife have such a good relationship. I also heard that William stayed abroad for seven years and has now returned. Bravely pursuing love. They say that on the day he returned. Someone saw him passionately embracing his lover. Oh. I'm so envious. When will I have a boyfriend like that? Or even someone like Mr. Liu. The colleague who sent me the video. Xiao Li. Seemed to sense something and quickly looked up at me. Seeing my unusual expression. He hurried to assign work to the girl, steering the conversation away with a smile. Boss, your wife would never betray you. You have to stay strong. We all need you to lead us. He whispered in my ear, trying to comfort me. I might need to take some time off. You'll have to lead the team while I'm gone. Shaoli gave me a hearty pat on the shoulder, his carefree attitude making him the one I trusted the most. Boss, don't talk like that, making it sound like you won't come back. I know you have important things to take care of at home. We'll be waiting for your return. I wanted to say something but stopped, finally just nodding silently. I asked the higher-ups to keep my resignation a secret or only tell them after I was gone. I checked myself into the hospital alone. The doctor seemed surprised to see me by myself. Young man, aren't you married? How can you do this alone? You need someone to take care of you. It's fine. I'll just hire a nurse in a little while. Chapter 4 On the first day of my hospitalization, I contacted Mary and told her I was sick, it was cancer. She laughed and said I was joking with her. Mary. You've been gone for a week now. When are you coming home? Can't you, as a grown man, stop being so caught up in love all the time? I want to have my own life too, but I really don't have much time left. I have cancer. Can you stop using that as a reason to threaten me? Who would believe that? The call abruptly ended, and she seemed a bit angry. The pain from the chemotherapy was truly unbearable. My hair started falling out in clumps, and from time to time, I couldn't help but vomit blood. I survived each day by getting hooked up to various four drips. Unable to eat anything. For an entire week, Mary didn't call me. I was so tormented by the cancer that I barely had the energy to care about anything else. In a moment of boredom, I flipped through the calendar, only to realize that today was Chishi Festival. There was no need for Lara's help. I had prepared a gift long ago, and it was sitting on the nightstand in our room, but she never noticed it. I couldn't resist calling her, wanting to hear her voice. Mary, 
Today is Chishi Festival. I've already taken the day off. Are you still at Lara's? I can come find you. Mary's voice sounded hurried and a bit impatient. There was noise in the background. Probably from some amusement park. Ethan. Lara's feeling down. How could we flaunt our love in front of her? That would just rub salt in her wounds. It's just another Chishi Festival. We can celebrate it next year. With that, she hurriedly hung up. And all I heard was the beeping of the ended call. How could it be the same? I might not live to see next year. These days of treatment had changed my routine as well. Because I never knew when I'd get sick. The pain tormented me so much that I couldn't sleep through the night. If I hadn't suddenly remembered to check my phone, I wouldn't even know what day it was. It's already the end of the month. I remembered that young girl mentioning that William would be holding a concert at the end of the month. I took out my phone, something I hadn't done in a while, and started scrolling through entertainment news online. Around 3 p.m., just after finishing my chemotherapy, I saw a trending topic suddenly shoot to the top on Weibo. The hashtag hashtag William wins his love hashtag was blazingly bright at the top spot. I clicked on it, and it was a video shot by the media along with related reports. In the video, William was kneeling on one knee, offering Mary a bouquet of pure white roses. Mary, overjoyed and tearful, threw herself into William's arms, and the two were united in love. Who could have imagined that the female lead in the video was a married woman, and that her husband was currently battling a life-threatening illness? Mary called me herself, trying to explain. Ethan, he's the brother I told you about. Everything online is just the media making things up. They misunderstood. I didn't want to think about it anymore, after all, I was dying soon. All right, Mary, I believe you. So, when are you coming home? For a moment, neither of us said anything. Perhaps my voice was too weak, and Mary could sense something, or maybe she was wondering why I was so willing to believe her. In the end, I'm not sure who touched the screen, but the silent call was disconnected. At that moment, I thought there was nothing left that I couldn't accept, but fate always loves to play tricks on me, and it made me run into Mary at the hospital. Chapter 5 The height of summer had passed, and they say September is a golden autumn. I had been cooped up in the hospital room for too long, so I asked the nurse to accompany me outside for some fresh air. The greenery around the hospital was nice, and a few white doves flew across the square. Feeling a bit of a chill, I decided it was better to head back to my room. As I turned to leave, a few whispered words carried by the wind stopped me in my tracks. I heard that William, who's been all the rage lately, has a girlfriend who's pregnant. Someone just saw them entering the obstetrics and gynecology department. I felt unsteady on my feet, and even the nurse beside me heard it and couldn't resist making a joke. That guy sure moves fast. It's only been half a month since the end of August, and his wife is already pregnant. Obviously, they were together before he even returned to the country. Putting on a show for everyone, how fake. I wasn't sure if it was anger or something else, but a wave of nausea hit me. Sir, are you alright? Please, help me to the obstetrics department. I want to see something. Didn't expect you to be so curious. Sir, I didn't respond, and we walked in silence the rest of the way. From a distance, I saw a familiar figure, my wife's figure, one I would never mistake. At that moment, William was crouching beside Mary, his head pressed gently against her stomach. The two of them exchanged smiles, and the air was thick with the sickly sweet scent of love. That stench of love made me feel nauseated. Since Mary and I got married, she had always been reluctant about our intimate moments and even insisted on living a child-free life. I thought she was afraid of the pain, and I was willing to respect her wishes, but it turns out she just didn't want to be with me. She just didn't want to have a child with me. My stomach started to cramp, and I bent over, gasping for breath. Sir, are you okay, sir? The nurse's voice was loud, drawing the attention of everyone around us, including Mary. Her expression was one of shock, as if she couldn't understand why I was here. The nurse helped me to the nearest bench and I asked him to bring Mary over. I wanted to go to her myself, but that place was for welcoming new life. They were the future of this world. They shouldn't have to see someone as useless as me or hear about such filthy things. I leaned back against the cold wall, watching Mary gently caress her abdomen as she slowly walked towards me. Ethan, what are you doing here? You mean the gentleman. He's in the late stages of stomach cancer. The nurse, a young man who spoke bluntly, assumed Mary was William's girlfriend and didn't think she had any connection to me. Ethan what's going on? Mary's voice was hoarse, tinged with a bit of a sob. What's going on? I wasn't entirely sure myself. After we got married, Mary stopped handing out flyers at the park entrance and said she wanted to be a stay-at-home wife. Even so, I never made her do any housework, turning her into a girl who had never lifted a finger. I wanted her to live a good life, so I worked hard, drinking and socializing endlessly. She loved luxury goods, and when she bought them, she never batted an eye. I climbed from an employee to the position of vice president, and my body gradually began to break down, but I knew it wasn't her fault, 
I would have worked hard even without her. I was just a bit sad, feeling it wasn't worth it. If she didn't like me, why did she accept my proposal in the first place? And if she accepted, why couldn't she be faithful to our marriage? Why choose to cheat? I told you before, I have stomach cancer. I'm going to die soon. Chapter 6 The doctor advised me to stay calm and avoid any strong emotional fluctuations. Maybe I was truly overwhelmed because the pain in my stomach twisted violently, and my teeth bit down so hard that they broke the skin of my lips. Finally, amidst Mary's desperate calls, I lost consciousness. When I opened my eyes again, I was back in my hospital room. Instinctively, I wanted to ask the nurse for a glass of water, but I noticed that the person sitting beside me was Mary. It had been over a month since we last saw each other, and seeing her now felt like a lifetime had passed. She held a cup of water and offered it to me but I couldn't sit up to drink it. The nurse quickly arrived and placed a straw in the cup. Mary looked a bit embarrassed, no surprise, as she had never taken care of anyone before. Honey, I'm sorry, it's all my fault. I shook my head, not understanding why she suddenly switched back to calling me honey, but I didn't want to hear it anymore. Mary, let's get a divorce. From now on, just call me by my name. Mary's eyes filled with tears, and she began to sob softly, shaking her head repeatedly. No, I don't want a divorce. Let's not divorce please. I couldn't understand what she was holding on to. Wasn't her beloved unforgettable first love already back? Why wouldn't she let me go? Mary, you're pregnant, aren't you? Whose child is it? I looked at her sharply, staring intently at Mary's face as her eyes darted around. It's Williams, isn't it? Lara has been on a business trip this month. What breakup were you supposedly comforting her for? I was getting emotional, yelling to vent the grievances and dissatisfaction that had been festering inside me. Mary, I saw that photo in the study. He's your unforgettable first love, the one you've been waiting for. I don't care that you deceived me. Now that he's back and you're carrying his child, why can't you just let me go? My heart raced, making my stomach churn with waves of nausea. Mary covered her face with both hands, and large teardrops slipped through her fingers. But my sharp eyes noticed the blisters on her hands, marks left by splattering oil while cooking. My heart grew colder. I had never let her into the kitchen. In our seven years together, she had never cooked a meal for me. The girl I had loved and spoiled had turned around and cooked for someone else. In the end, I wasn't worth it. Honey, I really never thought about divorcing you. Mary kept repeating that sentence. But to my ears, it was like nails on a chalkboard. I couldn't help but roar like a madman, pounding my fists against the bed frame. She doesn't want a divorce. So what does she want? To have her cake and eat it too. A husband who takes care of her every need on one side and her unforgettable first love to keep her happy on the other. How bold she must be to say such things. At that moment, William burst in, cradling the sobbing Mary in his arms. His eyes filled with hostility as he looked at me. Ethan, right, do you know that Mary is pregnant and can't have any emotional stress? Are you deliberately trying to make her suffer? I couldn't comprehend how William could say such things with such self-righteousness. Mary is my wife, and she's carrying your child. Now I'm dying, who's asking if I'm okay? William, as long as I'm alive, you will always be the third wheel. Even though I was determined to divorce, I couldn't resist a sharp retort. Seeing the growing anger on his face brought a small measure of satisfaction to my otherwise miserable state. Mary nestled into William's arms, burying her head in his chest, they really were a well-matched couple. Mary will divorce you soon. William left those words hanging in the air, and I genuinely hoped she would divorce me right away. But I had a feeling that with someone like her, I wouldn't be rid of her even in death. After the two of them left, the room fell silent. The nurse looked at me, clearly shocked. Sir, I never imagined that someone who looked so decent could act so despicably, what a pair of scoundrels. His words, spoken in defense of me, brought a slight warmth to my heart, knowing there was at least one person on my side. Chapter 7 Something unexpected happened, the incident that occurred at the hospital was recorded by someone and uploaded to the internet. It quickly became a hot topic, sparking widespread discussion. William was labeled as the homewrecker, and his relationship with Mary was dragged through the mud. The comments section was filled with insults calling them scumbag and cheating couple, with people cursing them with the harshest words. People at the company also saw the video and soon learned about my stomach cancer. They stood up for me, using their social media accounts to voice their support. I'm one of Ethan's subordinates. Our boss works himself to the bone, drinking and socializing, and ended up with stomach cancer just to earn money to support Mary. Her cheating is just inhumane. Mr. Liu is diligent and truly loves his wife. It's hard to believe that such a good person could be betrayed like this. Mr. Liu even prepared a Chi festival gift for Mary the other day. Mary truly has no heart. As I read through these comments, I didn't know whether to feel sad or happy. I was, of course, glad that they spoke up for me, but their words hit right where it hurt, making it clear to the whole world that I was nothing more than a simp. Yet, the final outcome was favorable. 
William and Mary, once the envy of everyone as a legendary couple, had now become the targets of public scorn. Some even created a timeline documenting their affair, gathering evidence of their infidelity. I didn't have the energy to do any of that, nor did I want to be involved. William was the first to approach me, hoping I would help clear his name by claiming that I had already divorced Mary. He truly was shameless, stealing my wife and then expecting me to willingly take the fall as the ex-husband. What a dream. I do want to get divorced. Why don't you get married to agree already? You pestering me won't help. You're not the one divorcing me. I lay in my hospital bed, feeling more at ease than I had in a long time. William's expression was off, it seemed he and Mary were already having issues. He wanted to say more, even resorting to trying to intimidate me. But before he could make a move, my colleagues, who had come to visit, stepped in and stopped him. They were all holding back their anger. Over the years, they had witnessed how I treated Mary. Now, not only did I have stomach cancer, but I had also been cheated on. They were on my side and couldn't swallow this injustice either. There were quite a few of them, and what was once a spacious hospital room now felt crowded. A few of the younger, more hot-headed ones couldn't hold back and threw a few punches at William, teaching him a lesson. William had no choice but to leave in disgrace. The news of my resignation couldn't be kept from them after all, and that young, sentimental girl was now crying her eyes out. As a patient, I found myself constantly comforting them. It might sound odd, but I was enjoying myself. They made me feel like I had a family. Chapter 8 The situation online escalated quickly, and many media outlets, along with independent journalists, soon found out which hospital I was staying at. They rushed in, eager to get a scoop, but I was too weak to drive them away. Mr. Ethan, when did you first discover that Mary was cheating? Mr. Ethan, what are your thoughts on William? Mr. Ethan, how do you plan to punish the two of them? Their barrage of questions made my head spin, worsening my already exhausted state. These people were so desperate for headlines that they stooped to harassing a terminally ill cancer patient. At that moment, a faint female voice came from behind the crowd. It was Mary. The moment they noticed her, all the cameras swung around, cornering Mary. I watched as her pale face grew weaker, almost fainting. Surrounded by flashing lights, she could only cling helplessly to the wall. Thankfully, the nurse arrived in time, and the security guards escorted everyone out. I never imagined that Mary would become so ruthless, but not toward me, toward the child in her womb. When she appeared before me again, her abdomen was flat, and her face was haggard. Honey, I've aborted the child. Can we not divorce? Her weak face managed a faint smile, with a fragile beauty about it, but I couldn't understand. Wasn't this the child she had longed for over seven years? Why would she abort it? Mary, it's no use. We should divorce. Honey, I didn't mean to deceive you. I was afraid you'd misunderstand. That day when William returned, I was really happy. I had a bit too much to drink, and we ended up sleeping together. I was blinded by my childhood love. But when I found out you were sick, I couldn't stop imagining the pain of losing you. That pain was unbearable. I realized I had already fallen in love with you, but I didn't know it. Mary spoke passionately, placing all the blame on a drunken mistake, on love that she didn't realize she had. But if the first time was a mistake, what about the entire following month? If she hadn't discovered that I was terminally ill, would she have never realized she loved me? How hypocritical. I said all of this to Mary, leaving her speechless stuttering as she tried to argue but couldn't find the words. Honey, I went home yesterday, and I saw the Chishi Festival gift you left for me on the nightstand. You still love me. So, she saw the gift. Maybe I did love you then, but I don't anymore. Mary's eyes gradually dimmed, but no matter what I said, she was still determined not to divorce me. Mary, I don't want to see you. The love I had for her had long been worn away by her lies and betrayals, leaving nothing behind. She shook her head desperately trying to throw herself into my arms as she used to, but I coldly dodged her advance. I wanted to send her away, but she insisted on staying to take care of me. This only made me more irritated. She had never taken care of anyone, and she had just had an abortion, leaving her body weak. What was she trying to prove by staying here? Outside, the leaves were already turning yellow, scattered by the autumn wind, drifting everywhere, just like me, lonely and broken, with my body in pieces. This was no longer the height of summer. It was no longer the summer that lived in my heart. The nurse was openly hostile toward Mary, often going out of his way to make things difficult for her. But Mary endured it all, which surprised me. I was also puzzled that she had been here for three days and yet William hadn't come looking for her. As they say, a woman's heart is as unpredictable as the depths of the ocean. Chapter 9 On the fifth day, William hobbled into my hospital room, wearing a patient's gown and walking with a limp. I was surprised to see him, when he saw Mary diligently attending to me. His anger flared up. He grabbed Mary by the collar, ready to start a fight in the hospital room, but the nurse quickly intervened to stop him. Mary, you have no heart. You took advantage of me being drunk, 
tied me up, and if it weren't for a paparazzo sneaking in this morning and finding me, I would have starved to death at home. This was a lot to take in. I observed Mary's expression and noticed a trace of resentment. Why didn't I just let you starve to death? My husband is here fighting cancer, and you don't deserve to have it easy. William's eyes were filled with disbelief. His eyes reddened, and he punched the wall of the hospital in frustration, venting his anger. What did you just say? I went abroad for seven years for you, enduring endless scorn, finally succeeding, and this is how you repay me. Mary, unable to control her emotions, pushed William hard, looking almost deranged. You did that for yourself. I begged you back then, begged you to take me with you, but you said I was a burden. Now, seven years have passed. I've been married and fallen in love with my husband. Why have you come back to disturb my life? I couldn't listen to this any longer. These two were just passing the blame back and forth, never recognizing their own mistakes. Maybe it's true that I don't love her anymore because my heart didn't even flinch, but I couldn't stay here any longer. The chemotherapy was already painful enough, and with them disturbing me, it made me feel like I couldn't even die in peace. When William found out that Mary had aborted the child, he immediately became despondent, collapsing onto the floor, perhaps that had been his last hope, now completely shattered. Mary, one hand on the table and the other on her abdomen, suddenly started laughing. She laughed until tears streamed down her face, her eyes filled with a twisted sense of satisfaction. They were both mad. The noise grew so loud that a nurse came to check and scolded them, bringing the farce to an end. But for me, it was time to leave. I asked the nurse to process my discharge papers, and while Mary was out buying food, I quickly left the hospital. The nurse told me I shouldn't do this, but it didn't matter anymore, I didn't want to continue the treatment. I figured I'd spend the time I had left exploring the beautiful landscapes of my country. The nurse, who was a fresh graduate, agreed to come with me when I asked if he wanted to join. And so, the two of us set off on a journey. We made it to Tiananmen Square just in time for the National Day flag-raising ceremony, which filled me with pride. I originally planned to climb Xiangshan to see the red leaves, but my body couldn't handle it, so I just rested at the foot of the mountain. We then headed to the seaside, where the sight of the deep blue ocean gradually brought peace to my mind. Next, we went to Yunnan, where we marveled at the grandeur of Tsangshan and Irai, in Lijiang Old Town. We rented a small inn to stay in, but my health was rapidly declining, forcing me to stop and rest. One evening, I received a call from a colleague. When I answered, I was surprised to hear Mary's voice on the other end. Honey, we're not going to get divorced, right? I didn't respond because none of this mattered to me anymore. I had no intention of continuing this entanglement. After all, I was going to die soon. Honey, I'll give you an explanation. With that, she hung up. It wasn't until the next day when the nurse rushed in, panic in his voice, showing me his phone with the news. Only then did I understand what Mary meant by an explanation. William was dead. Chapter 10 The news reported that the renowned pianist William was found dead in his villa apparently due to a gas leak that caused an explosion. By the time his body was discovered, it was burned beyond recognition, his face completely disfigured. It's easy to imagine the immense pain he must have endured before he died. Soon after, another piece of news shot to the top of the trending list, Mary had jumped to her death from the hospital rooftop. I was unexpectedly calm, only mildly surprised. I didn't expect them to die before I did. This was merely the consequence of their own actions. My colleagues at the company called me one after another especially the colleague who had lent Mary his phone that day. He felt guilty, thinking he shouldn't have given Mary his phone. I reassured him that it was okay, that they brought this upon themselves. However, Shaoli was indignant, saying several times, they deserved it, which made me chuckle a little. They wanted to come see me, but I was already at the end of my rope. Their visit would only add to the sorrow. I didn't want to endure any more goodbyes. Seven summers ago, my mother passed away, also from stomach cancer. Perhaps I should have seen my own fate coming. I gave a portion of my savings to the nurse, it was his payment for accompanying me through the final stretch of my life. After all these years of saving, I realized that the amount was quite substantial. The rest, along with my other assets, I donated to charity. I hope they can use the money to save others like me who are tormented by illness. Finally, on a quiet night, I saw my mother's silhouette. She told me I had suffered enough. I suddenly remembered that I should have left a large sum of money for the owner of the inn. I was probably going to die here and my death would leave a trace of misfortune on his property. After settling everything, I lay quietly on the bed, gazing at the bright moon in the sky, and then, I closed my eyes forever.